So I, I kind of um, describe the color spectrum of the Iranian government post-June 12th, uh, ranging from pitch black to dark gray. And I think a good litmus test of this is uh, the current speaker of the parliament, Ali Larijani. If you were following the Western media 10 years ago, Ali Larijani was described as an arch hardliner. Uh, today you read about him in the New York Times as a moderate or a pragmatist. So it's, see how, how uh, this rightward shift has taken place. Now I think for uh, the, the current clique in power, and I would describe them as a cartel, a cartel of hardline and nouveau riche revolutionary guardsmen and hardline clergymen. Uh, one thing that's very central to their identity is enmity towards the United States, particularly for Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, he believes that opposition to the United States was a very important pillar of the 1979 revolution. And again, it's inextricably linked to their identity as an Islamic Republic. Um, to, to give you one example of this, when I was based in Tehran several years ago with the International Crisis Group, uh, I remember in 2005, the United States finally lifted its veto to Iran's accession to the World Trade Organization. And that day I happened to be in the office of a fairly senior Iranian official who had a PhD in economics from the United States. And he was very upset that the United States had finally lifted its accession to the World Trade Organization. I said, well, why are you upset? Isn't this in Iran's economic interest? He said, for 10 years we convinced the hardliner, it took us 10 years to convince our hardliners in Tehran that it's in our interest to join the WTO. And now that the US has finally lifted their veto, they think it's probably not in our interest because the United States allows us to join. So for many of these <laughs> individuals in Tehran, they kind of define their Iran's interest by that which is opposed to the United States. Now, Khamenei um, rules by consensus, not decree. Uh, but get him, w w what's transpired post-June is that he's surrounded himself <laughs> by with individuals whose default position is essentially defiance uh, and escalation. And uh, the figures that were in the government in, in prior years, whether Mohammed Khatami or Hashimir Afsanjani, are, are, are not anymore uh, in these key decision-making structures. Um, and there's no one really there to, to de-escalate. When someone escalates, there's no one there to, to de-escalate. Where do we go from here? Um, w w what's very interesting I, I would describe now is that the opposition to this current uh, arrangement, which, which Bob Einhorn was talking about, the deal that was um, negotiated in Geneva, the internal opposition in Iran, I think is as much internal, is, is as much opposition to Ahmadinejad making that deal than it is to the deal itself. Uh, meaning, I think many of the people whom you've seen come out against the deal, whether it's uh, Ali Larijani or even uh, the reformist opposition, uh, Musa B. Khatami, etc., uh, they don't want to see Ahmadinejad make that deal. Um, but it's not necessarily that they would, they, they're uh, opposed to the deal in principle. And I spoke to um, a member of the opposition who said that whatever position Ahmadinejad was going to take on this, we were going to oppose him. Now, I, th I think that, uh, that being said, th there's reasons for the Iranian government to um, at least feign an interest in compromise or feign an interest in, in, in has an interest in pro prolonging these ne negotiations. I would say, first of all, um, the regime has, uh, is in an unprecedented crisis, uh, something truly is historic, of, uh, something truly historic is afoot in Iran. Uh, we've seen uh, popular uprisings like we haven't seen since 1979. Um, and while there's so much internal unrest, it may make sense for them at various points when they feel vulnerable um, to feign an interest in compromise, to stave off that external pressure uh, until they can try to get their internal house in order. Uh, a second reason I think that they may feel compelled at some points to, to compromise is uh, in search of legitimation in the sense that uh, when at home uh, the government um, is perceived by a large chunk of the population as an illegitimate government, uh, one way that Ahmadinejad may try to uh, redeem himself in the public eye is to show that great powers have legitimized us, uh, that we're in negotiations with the United States, they've legitimized us. Now, 
In terms of, again, where we go from here and what is the view from Tehran, I would say that there's uh, a few points, some, are, some of which I think are, are problematic from the U.S. vantage point and others which I think will make it very difficult to reach some type of a modus vivendi. Um, I think first, um, from the Iranian vantage point, they believe that their enrichment, indigenous enrichment, is now a fait accompli. Um, that's no longer what's being negotiated. This may be enshrined in foreign UN, four UN Security Council resolutions that Iran must cease enrichment, but from their vantage point, that is not, no longer what is being negotiated. They believe the Obama administration uh, has come around to accept the idea of enrichment on Iranian <coughs> soil. Second, I think that uh, Iran has backed itself into a very awkward position in the sense that its primary ally now is Russia, uh, a country in which there's tremendous mistrust of, uh, both uh, at an elite political level in Iran, uh, but also at a popular level. Uh, there's perhaps uh, no country, if you look at the last century of Iranian history, there's perhaps no country that, um, from the vantage point of the Iranian people, one would argue they've, they've been le less sympathetic to, to, to the will of the Iranian people, going back to the 1906 Constitutional Revolution. And I think uh, if you've followed some of the street protests in recent months, you notice that one of the chants which has really taken root is death to Russia. Um, third, I think this is another reason why it's going to make um, a compromise uh, uh, difficult for Iran or reaching a modus vivendi with Iran difficult is that on one hand, as I mentioned, Khamenei has surrounded himself by people whose default position is defiance and not compromising. Uh, on the other hand, one thing that's been his modus operandi the last two decades as leader is that you never compromise when you're under pressure. Um, in the face of pressure, whether it's sanctions, military threats, etc., never compromise. Because if you compromise, uh, that's not going to alleviate the pressure. That's going to project weakness and invite even more pressure. So in some ways, whether the United States takes an engagement approach, um, their default position at the moment is, is uh, non-compromising or, or defiance. Uh, but even if we start to escalate a little bit and increase the pressure, uh, his instincts start to say we, we can't compromise under pressure because that's going to increase it. Um, lastly, I would say that what's going to be very problematic for the United States is some of the ways in which Iran has sought to gain leverage in these negotiations. Uh, and I'm talking about um, the charges yesterday against these three hikers uh, for espionage, um, which I think that uh, when, I, when I speak to people within Iran's foreign ministry themselves, they know these charges are, are farcical. Or the charges, for example, against um, uh, Iranian-American scholar Kian Tajbaksh, 15-year prison sentence. Um, and I think this is going to be very difficult for, for um, in, in these negotiations if Iran uh, believes it's, it, 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 it can somehow gain leverage uh, in these ways on its nuclear file um, by essentially uh, exchanging um, um, American citizens to, to again enhance its leverage. Um, one, one last point I would make uh, for, for the Obama administration is that I think Bob Einhorn is absolutely right that the Obama administration's uh, engagement approach um, has reaped dividends in a way which the Bush administration's hardline approach didn't, in the sense that whereas the Bush administration's approach, I would argue, inadvertently uh, united Iran's competing factions against a common threat. I think the Obama administration's engagement approach has accentuated the internal divides in Iran, both amongst political elites, both between the regime and the people. Uh, but I think we've also made it clear to whether it's our allies in Europe or the Russians and the Chinese that it's not the United States which is the unreasonable, unreasonable actor in this equation. Uh, it's Iran. So I think that certainly has been proven. Um, but I think it's going to be very difficult, in my opinion, to reach a modus vivendi or a nuclear accommodation with a regime which believes it needs us as an enemy. And second, I think it's going to be a challenge to try to reach that modus vivendi with the government um, without betraying um, the will of the many people in Iran who are opposed to the government. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem.